Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles, a series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Zachary Taylor and the focus is Clash with the President. The year is 1846 and Taylor is fresh off of his first victories in the Mexican-American War, victories at Palo Alto and Resaca del Palma. He was promoted to a major general and talk of presidency is in the air for Zachary Taylor, which he wanted nothing to do with. In fact, he was frustrated with his task at hand. He wanted to go chase the Mexican army further, but he lacked supplies, insufficient transportation. He had to wait to resupply before he could be ready to go. Well, while he's resupplying, he not only got more provisions, he got more men. Lots of volunteers started showing up after the first couple of victories, and his force had swelled to about 11,000, although a lot of volunteer militia, frankly, were more trouble than they were worth. Taylor had never been a big fan of the militia, and he certainly wasn't a fan of a lot of the folks who showed up, who were undisciplined, not really trained in the arts of war. Nevertheless, he did bring them into his camp. He did welcome one person in particular, a volunteer, a colonel from the state of Mississippi. His former son-in-law, son Jefferson Davis, showed up and actually would become part of Taylor's inner circle for the rest of this campaign. When he was finally fully supplied, he took his men across the Rio Grande on July 6th into Mexican territory. His destination was the fortress town of Monterey. It was about 350 miles away. They actually had to stop about halfway in at Camargo. This was a tough trip. The sun was bearing down on them. There's only one road. And once again, they didn't have enough supply or transportation to get all the way in, in one trip. And so they had to pause at Camargo, resupply, finally get to Monterey in late September. This was going to be a tough fight. Monterey was the capital of the Mexican state of Nuevo Leon. It had about 12,000 inhabitants. General Pedro de Ampudio was in charge of the Mexican force there with about 10,000 soldiers mostly regulars. He had about 42 cannon uh, at his disposal as well, while Taylor brought about 7,000 men into the fight with only about a dozen pieces of artillery. The town was in essence one giant fortress. The houses were made of stone. There were natural parapets uh, atop most of them for, for snipers to be able to fire upon the Americans. Each dwelling was practically a separate castle, one grand fortification that the Americans were facing. The first step that General Taylor decided to do before entering the town was actually to try to block the escape of Ampudia. He sent General William Worth around to the other side of town to capture the Saltillo Road, which he did, perfect success, and then they began a two-pronged attack. Worth from one side of town and Taylor from the other, step by step trying to get to the center of town. It was bloody. It was slow against an entrenched foe, against with these natural fortifications, door-to-door -door fighting. Every inch was costly for the Americans, but they were undeterred, kept making that progress and unrelenting attack against the Mexicans, pushing him back toward the center of town in the Citadel, which was the center of the community. By September 23rd, Ampudi had actually had enough. He knew it was only a matter of time, and he actually asked for an, op an opportunity to discuss terms with General Taylor. There were several back and forths between the commands of, of both armies before they finally did agree to terms, and those terms were pretty liberal. The town would be turned over to the Americans, but the Mexican troops could retire, would retire without parole, which meant that they could fight again, and Taylor also agreed to an eight-week armistice, or until they re either side received contrary orders from their own government. Now, all of northern Mexico was in the hands of Zachary Taylor. He was three for three in major military victories, but there was no celebration in Washington. In fact, President Polk was angry. He thought these terms were way too generous. According to Polk, in agreeing to this armistice, General Taylor violated his express orders, and I regret that I cannot approve his course. General Taylor, I fear, is not the man for command of the army. He is brave, but he does not seem to have resources or grasp of mind enough to conduct such a campaign. He allowed these troops to, the Mexican troops to leave, an eight-week armistice. What was he thinking? This was in the mind of James Polk, who wanted to beat that enemy so that he could get capitulation and, frankly, end up with the land that he was seeking from Mexico in the first place. So Taylor was formally rebuked. He was ordered to withdraw from the armistice, which, frankly, didn't sit very well with Zachary Taylor. According to Madison Mills on his staff, the old man is very angry and flies about like an old hen with one chicken. Well, Taylor did follow his orders. He withdrew from the ar armistice, but he didn't just sort of take this lying down. He defended himself in a public letter. His letter 
pr provides the reasoning of why he did what he did. And he said in detail, the consideration of humanity was present to my mind during the conference which led to the convention and outweighed in my judgment the doubtful advantages to be gained by a resumption of the attack upon the town. This conclusion has been fully confirmed by an inspection of the enemy's position and means since the surrender. It was discovered that his principal magazine, containing an immense amount of powder, was in the cathedral, completely exposed to our shells from two directions. The explosion of this mass of powder, which must have ultimately resulted from a continuance of the bombardment, would have been infinitely disastrous, involving the destruction not only of Mexican troops, but of non-combatants and even our own people had we pressed the attack. Besides, another important point, he couldn't follow Ampudia anyway. This is why he took that eight-week uh, armistice and agreed to it. It wasn't a random number. He was once again out of supplies, insufficient transportation. He knew he needed several weeks to reprovision before he was going to be able to take the fight back to the enemy anyway. So there was a logic and rationale behind each of these elements of decision. By the way, he continued his defense. He was seeking, in his mind, a path to a conclusion of this conflict, but a peaceful one that he thought was actually viable at the time. According to Taylor, uh, in the conference with General Impudia, I was distinctly told by him that he had invited it to spare the further infusion of blood, and because General Santa Ana had declared himself favorable to peace. I knew that our government had made propositions to that of Mexico to negotiate, and I deem that the char change of government in that country since my last instructions fully warranted me in entertaining consideration of policy. My grand motive in moving forward with very limited supplies had been to increase the inducements of the Mexican government to negotiate for peace. Well, this all made things worse. Taylor's letters uh, got uh, published in the, uh, in the public press angered uh, the commander-in-chief. Taylor just didn't get it, according to Polk. He needed to crush the enemy's army, not just capture towns. That was the way to get them to capitulate. So a question reasonably asked is, who was right? In this case, both arguments actually have merit. Think about it from both perspectives, because their perspectives were, in fact, different. Polk, of course, is focusing on the big picture. He wants to win. That's by defeating armies. You don't let them go. You don't have long armistice uh, available to them. Give them a chance to fight another day. You attack them. You kill them. And that drives capitulation. For this, he was angry that Taylor did not follow that line of thinking, which has merit. At the same time, Taylor was the man on the, on the ground, and he fought aggressively when it was time to fight, but he also cared about the human cost. He wasn't going to waste lives, and besides, he knew he needed to restock, which is why he agreed to that lengthy armistice. Reality was communications, of course, of this era were very poor. Commanders on the ground often had to be given plenty of leeway to make these kinds of decisions. He was well within his authority to do so. And so you can see from Taylor's perspective, full merit to his way of thinking as well. The final say in all of this, even if they both had merit, of course, lands in the commander-in-chief. Ultimately, the president decides where you go, and when he had the chance to communicate, he was ready to make some changes. In part, in his mind, he couldn't escape the fact that there were political talks in the air about Taylor. This definitely impacted his thinking. He did say, I am now satisfied that General Taylor, he is a narrow-minded, bigoted partisan without resources and wholly unqualified for the command he holds. He was frustrated about Taylor's decision. He saw politics in the air, and he, in fact, had every right to make changes, which he was about to do, but that is the story for another day. That is Zachary Taylor and Clash with the President and the Life of Zachary Taylor. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.